He's an ambush on the DNZ <laughs> headquarters. Uh, quite an elaborate uh, <laughs> um, ambush there. Uh, why don't you tell us what happened and what your the purpose was? Right. Well, the ambush, that's a great word, by the way. We never thought of that as an ambush, but that's a good way to put it. Uh, it was part of a series of protests. Uh, we had already done protests at the Trump Hotel about some Trumpism. We blocked I-395 when the lame duck session was beginning. And we had a group of people together who were there because we wanted to make sure that the TPP did not get ratified during the lame duck session. And when President Obama backed off on that and we won, uh, we changed our tactics and our and our goals, and we wanted to fit in the political times that we're currently in. After the election, we had the two most unpopular candidates in history from the two corporate parties, and we give a lot of attention to Donald Trump. He's getting a lot of attention in protests, deservedly so, but we also wanted to make sure people remember that the Democratic Party was part of the problem. And the Democrats uh, have had eight years in power, and it's been very much a, a presidency for the wealthy. 97% uh, of the growth in the economy has gone to the wealthiest. The wealth divide has expanded. Uh, the people at the lower levels are feeling uh, less economically secure after eight years of Democratic rule. And it was President Obama who had pushed the TPP. And of course, Hillary Clinton was exposed um, in her two-faced ways with her public and private positions, et cetera, uh, during the campaign. So we want people to not forget, while we're busy with Trump, the Democratic Party essentially fertilized the land for Trump. Uh, they made it possible for his seeds to grow. And in fact, the leaked emails show that the Democrats uh, in the Clinton campaign actually worked to uh, uh, to help Trump get going. They saw him as the better candidate for them. So we want people not to, to realize this is not just about Trump. This is about oligarchy. This is about corporate control of elections, corporate control of our government, an unfair economy rigged for the wealthy because of this corruption. And our solution is not to get more Democrats in power. Our solution is a new system, and that's what we have to be working for, a much bigger goal than just uh, challenging Trump. Well, that's a big enough goal as it is, because we're going to have a very difficult next four years. All right, I'm going to play some uh, footage of the, the recent protest. And, uh, man, so I, I you guys didn't quite make it into the building. What was your plan, and... Um, did you get a permit for this? Doesn't doesn't look like it. But man, I see I see Kevin do he laughs. I see Kevin at so many protests. Um, so yeah, tell us about the whole your your methods and what your you know what were you gonna do if you got inside there? Well, we never get pro, uh, permits for protests. Uh, we really see the First Amendment as our permit, and we stick with that. And my job is usually to talk to the police, and I can usually explain what's going on in a way that results in uh, de-escalation from their perspective. But as you can see in this protest, there was no de-escalation. Uh, the, the security guards were swearing at us. They were pulling at us. It was pretty aggressive. Our plan was to get inside. Uh, I was going to go talk to security and say, we're here. Uh, we were ordered by the people to evict you, and we're going to move out your stuff. Uh, we're going to start down here, and we'll work up to Donna Brazil's office later, so let her know we're on our way. Yeah. And, and uh, the idea then was for, uh, I think Margaret was going to go down the hall and try to get a picture of the telephone calling room where the Democrats come from the Congress a few blocks away and make telephone calls for hours every day uh, raising money. And so we want to get a picture of that so you could see that that really exists. And we want to then start to have people start moving furniture out. They're going to pick up a chair, pick up a, a table in their sitting area and start to move it out. We also had boxes uh, that were labeled various um, topics which you see later in the video. Um, and we were going to move those out and you know, show those as we walked out, show the, the box of uh, excuses, the box of uh, uh, lesser evil propaganda, et cetera. And so that's, that was the plan, was to highlight all of that by being inside. And then outside, you'll see what happens. Um, we had uh, other people waiting to come by with uh, big signs uh, to essentially tell the story of the DNC's betrayal of the people. And so we had a massive sign that said betrayal. And that was the main message of the day. The Democratic Party betrayed the people. And that's why we now have Donald Trump, because the, the Democrats lost the faith of people, especially in the Rust Belt, uh, where they've lost jobs to these corporate trade deals. And that's what these are, by the way, corporate trade deals. They're not, they're not free trade. These are designed, written by the corporations with the U.S. Trade Rep. The U.S. Trade Rep himself was a Citigroup executive. 
And so, you know, this is the reality of Washington, D.C.'s crony capitalism. And that's why the Democrats lost. They just can no longer, you know, um, survive with that reality. Let me ask you, okay, I say, um, I'm a registered Democrat. I'm, you, I, I, you, 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 you can change that. <laughs> well, this is your opportunity. There is the Green Party. This you is know? your opportunity to, to make the case. And uh, I mean, if anybody who's paid attention to my videos, as you know, I'm definitely uh, leaning third party. And I did vote third party this election. Sure. Um, so, but how about you? So you, you're very vocal for third parties. Uh, you've even worked with the Green Party uh, for a while now since Ralph Nader helped the Jill Stein campaign. So let me ask you, were you ever a Democrat or Republican? Uh, and, like, is there a moment that, like, what happened? <laughs> I was a Republican in high school in New York City when you had a group of Republicans who were also endorsed by the Progressive Party in New York. So it was a different kind of Republican. And, uh, you know, Jacob Javits, who was the first uh, person to introduce a marijuana decriminalization bill. Uh, John Lindsay, who was... Uh, uh, you know, uh, the mayor of New York and also endorsed by the Progressive Party. And so that, that kind of republic doesn't exist anymore. And so I can't, the, the ideology of the current Republican Party, while I can find a few slivers of agreement, there's not much. Uh, and I, work, I was a Democrat for a while um, in a, from Carter to, uh, to Clinton. Clinton lost me. Uh, and he lost me because of so many reasons. Uh, I was working on the drug war. And he put a general in charge of the drug war to outflank the Republicans on the right, which was absurd. How do you, you deal with drugs with a general? Uh, give me a break. Uh, and then he said so much on NAFTA, so much on uh, the social safety net. Uh, you know, on issue after issue, he, you know, just was undermining uh, what we needed to be doing in this country. And so he kind of continued the Reagan ideology uh, rather than creating an ideology that actually put, put people before a profit. And so that was, he just lost me. Uh, and I stayed lost. I mean, Obama didn't do anything to, I think he wrote for Obama. You know, I think it's great. We broke the, the uh, African-American barrier to the White House. Uh, Obama didn't stand for what I believe in. He was always a Wall Street Democrat before he ran for office. He was, uh, endure, he was funded mainly by the nuclear energy industry, uh, you know, uh, and uh, so his whole career was corporate and uh, his whole administration was corporate. He sold things like his health care program, you know, fraudulently. He bamboozled people. He said it was for to give more people health care, but it was really about a, a bailout of the insurance industry and a gift to the pharmaceutical industry and a gift to the Wall Street investors in for-profit health care. They're the ones who benefited. Obamacare has undermined uh, health insurance. It's undermined health care. It's robbed our public health services in order to give subsidized premiums to the insurance industry. Uh, and it's made insurance very class-based. You know, you have the, the gold, the silver, the, the platinum. You have, right from the top, you have all these class-based categories of insurance. And you have the poor getting Medicaid, which in many states is really poor health care. Uh, and so uh, he, and, 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 and premiums have gone up and out-of-pocket costs have gone up. People can't afford to use the insurance they have. He has made it so much worse in so many ways. And so I'm glad to see Obamacare will be repealed. I think one of our campaigns going forward is to uh, fill that void with the most American of health care, which is Medicare. And uh, that's the most successful part of our health care system. Low overhead, uh, pretty good service, although both parties have been weakening it. So we call for improved Medicare for all. Um, and uh, because the current Medicare system has been weakened by both the Republicans and Democrats, uh, and it's also been privatized, so we have to do a lot of work to improve Medicare, but it is the solution. And if, if, if Donald Trump wants a simple, easy way, to provide, cheap way, to provide health care to every person in the United States, it's to expand Medicare to cover everyone and to uh, improve it so it provides health care from cradle to grave, your teeth to your eyes to your body, all included. And that's the direction we need to go. And, and issue after issue, the Democrats do this. It's kind of like the public and private position of Hillary Clinton. On issue after issue, they sell us with this phony, it's good for the middle class, it's good for people, good for workers. And in reality, it's all about the corporations. I, unfortunately, I see Donald Trump doing the same thing. Donald Trump is coming in. He's talking about uh, you know big tax cuts for workers. If you look at his tax plan, it's not tax cuts for workers. Yeah. Those are small. Those are small. The big tax cuts are going to be for the wealthy. The big tax will be for the corporations, even though they are they're hoarding so much money right now. They have tremendous amounts of money in their reserves. 
He wants to give them more money. It's it's an absurdity. Uh, and he's going the opposite direction we need to go on, on taxes. We shouldn't have people earning 500000 a year paying the same tax rate as those earning a million, 10 million, or 100 million. We need a progressive tax rate above 500000 So those who are extremely wealthy, you know, the top 0.1%, are paying uh, a much higher tax rate than those who are less wealthy uh, in the 500000 100000 uh, category. So he's going in the wrong direction. It's going to hurt most people in the United States. Yeah. And that will be a rude awakening because he won because of economics. He won because people feel economically insecure. Uh, and his plans are not going to uh, be a benefit. In fact, the way he's going to pay for his infrastructure uh, program is to reward those who've hidden their money offshore. He's going to let them bring it back in the United States at a very low tax rate, almost a tax holiday, and then they will get tax breaks in order to, uh, tax credits in order to uh, put money into infrastructure. That's tax break after tax break for the wealthy. Uh, and is the infrastructure what we need? Yeah, we need roads. But how about transit? Is he going to do, is he do mass transit? Uh, is he going to upgrade the grid so we can use uh, clean, sustainable energy? Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to upgrade and put us into the 21st century and a new energy economy. Unfortunately, he is an oil and gas president. And, you know, he's going to, he's a bunch of oil and gas profiteers, including himself. You know, he invests in that in that in dirty energy, so he's not going to do what's needed. And uh, so it's going to be a real wake-up call for the people who voted for him that he actually undermines them rather than helps them. Yeah, I, I heard he's actually connected uh, to the DAPL pipeline through investments. That's right. That's right. Um, you mentioned that Trump, Pete, Trump won because of economics, because people are struggling so much uh, from economics, just paying the bills, uh, paying the rent. <laughs> um more economic, becoming more and more economically insecure. That's the trend, and so sticking with the status quo, that's not a safe bet. It'll just continue the, the decline. People that's realize right. that, so they're just desperate yeah. enough to even try Trump. Now, um, it, it seems to me that there, that, I mean, that that is something that unites all parties, right? Uh, left and the right, everybody has this uh, threat of, you know economics, um, right. mo increased uh, inequality, um, yep. income economic, e e economic insecurity. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Now, um, and, and I am, I have the impression that a universal basic income. Oh, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, it is, is something that can unite everybody. Why don't, can you please explain what a universal basic income is and, um, why – I don't understand, and maybe you can have some commentary on why doesn't one of these parties bring this up uh, to, to bring in you know, everyone? Um, well, you, know, you know, back in 1972, uh, the universal basic income was a central debate uh, in the presidential race between Richard Nixon and George McGovern. Both candidates supported a basic income. They just both went about it in a different way. Uh, so that's how much we moved. You know, from both parties supporting it to neither party talking about it. And, you know, a lot of it is the ideology um, that uh, giveaways are bad. Uh, but it's a, such a non-thinking perspective. Um, I, you know, the universal basic income uh, is basically a plan that would allow every person in the United States to get a certain amount of money each month uh, for basic living expenses. And that would immediately do away with poverty. And all the poverty programs, all the uh, you know housing programs to, for, to provide housing to the poor, people could afford their rent. So you immediately get rid of a whole lot of bureaucracy, and you uplift people so they can actually eat and sleep in a building, you know, and have a home. So it's a major improvement, and it would be a, a massive stimulus to the economy to have a, a an economy built from the bottom up. We've had two parties now who both believe in the wealthy getting wealthier and the money trickling down. That's, that was Obama's ideology as well as Reagan's ideology. And you can see it in the results of their the, the GDP under both. But if we built the economy from the bottom up, provide a strong foundation for the economy to build on, it's much more sensible and much more solid. Um, you have none of these risky derivative bets, uh, all this money going to the top to put into high-risk stuff that – uh, doesn't produce anything, uh, and instead you have people who are buying what's needed. So communities then would have money. 
local businesses would have customers. Uh, you could really build community-based economics uh, and people would feel secure. And it would provide those who have a job and are able to survive um, the freedom to, ex to explore their skills, to you know, put their time, extra time into other activities. Uh, and we wouldn't have to have a 40-hour work week. You know, so everything, everything could change in so many positive ways. Uh, with a universal basic income, but it's not income, but it's not even on the agenda. And so we've been advocating it now for, I don't know how many years, many years, and um, it, it's just not getting any traction. I think it's an ideo ideological problem. We, we, I think our job now as a movement, by the way, and this fits into the basic income, is to put forward a people's agenda. We know now we have two oligarch parties. We have a billionaire uh, who's been elected uh, as president, and he'll be his policies he's mentioned already are those that will support his kind of uh, friends and business partners, uh, and so that them saying the agenda is not going to be our agenda. So on popular resistance, uh, popularresistance.org, we just put up yesterday a people's agenda, and I'd love for people to go review it, check it out, give us your comments. It can it can change, but also to so show your support for it, sign up for it, because I think we as a movement one of the things we have to do is to put out the standard and be strong about it. And that standard existing will, as we advocate and mobilize and show our political power, will pull people toward it. So our job is to set the standard for the country, change the political dialogue. That's what movements need to do. So, you know, people think of movements just as protests, and we certainly do a lot of protests. You know, we've had some tremendously successful campaigns that were rooted in protests, you know, winning the net neutrality fight, which we'll have to have fight again probably, uh, because it looks like Paul Ryan wants to remove it, and so that'll be a fight. But that's such a critical issue. We hope many people get involved in that. We won that battle in part from protests. We occupied the FCC. Uh, we did all sorts of great actions around that and won. Um, and, you know, we won the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is yeah. the people versus transnational corporate power. So we do have power. And we got to express that power. We have to up that power now that the Republicans control both the, Dem the House and the Senate and the presidency. So we really need to increase our resources, get people involved, and really expand our mobilization. So there's a lot of work ahead. Yeah. No, the TPP is a great example of progress. That was a huge uh, success. I mean... I, now, is it really... A, I mean, it's not 100... We're not 100% in the clear, though, are we? Or, or are we? You know... You are never 100% in the clear. Yeah. Uh, when you win, the other side is going to fight back. And so while it may not come back as the TPP, mm. it may come back as something else. Um, some other, you know, the TPP is a reaction to the WTO, uh, which has been stagnant for since 1999, since the Seattle protests. And so their way around the stagnation of WTO was multilateral trade agreements like the, like the TPP and the uh, the, the European uh, trade agreement Obama was pushing, the services agreement Obama was pushing. He had three major tre uh, trade agreements he was pushing. All three seem dead now. Uh, and they were a response to the failure of WTO. So, you know, five years, 10 years from now, uh, maybe sooner, uh, we will see the, you know, the corporations pushing again uh, for more corporate profits and more power to control governments around the world. And we'll be have to fight that. So it's an ongoing struggle. It's never, mm -hmm. yes, we're safe, but no, we have to keep vigilant and keep people educated and mobilized. That was a five-year campaign, the TPP, mm -hmm. over five years. We started, and that's what we called our site, Flush the TPP. Uh, we started, no one can remember what the TPP was. So we started using toilet paper humor, uh, toilet paper plus, and TPP. And so flush the toilet paper plus. And so that's how, you know, we decided to educate about this. And we use protests to educate. The reason we do these uh, protests that are so uh, uh, inspiring and that, that, that draw people to them is because that is how we educate in a social media world. You know, we covered the U.S. trade rep with massive signs uh, at a noon, noon on a workday. And that got major attention, including the Washington Post, calling it the greatest guerrilla protest ever. Um, and, you know, the spectacle protest creates a spectacle to educate people, mobilize them, and give them some hope to encourage to, to emulate it and to move forward. So 
There's lots of reasons for protest, but it's only one of our tools. We spend a lot of time on TV writing about TP, explaining it to people, doing um, interviews on various news outlets. So there's a lot, multi number of tools that we can use, uh, but spectacle protest is certainly a key one. Um, because so d did you? Certainly, we have uh, many obstacles, many you know ways that our freedoms being threatened. Uh, you know, NSA, uh, reading all our emails, government surveillance, um, corporate trade agreements. Um, now, I, I feel that I got – sorry to bring it back to universal basic income, but – I know you love that issue. I, you know I love it, but here, here's think, the thing. Think, 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 think how great your life would be if you could do these great, you do these great videos and you struggle. So it would be so nice if someone like you could use your talents yes. without – without the economic limits that the reality of the, of the current economy puts on you. Exactly. I mean, and that, that's why, you know, these are very, very real threats, these things. We're we, it's so hard to fight back because everybody needs to earn up, you know, needs to dedicate most of their waking hours just to, you know, being able to pay the bills to survive. Um, it, also, it, it also is a reason why so many people are forced into the military. People are forced into the military because they have no options. If we had what we should have, universal basic income, uh, uh, a free uh, college paid for by taxes, so it doesn't cost any, any tuition. Uh, you know, we could really have a different, a whole different economy, and a, a much more, much less militaristic one as well. Now, so let me ask you. I mean, you, um, you were, were you, in, you were in touch with Jill Stein during the campaign, um, I believe, correct? A yeah. Little oh, bit? yeah. So, yeah, no, I was a senior advisor to her campaign. Okay, so when, like, when. Did you bring up? Did people bring up the the guaranteed income? Uh, why? Because I know it's part of the Green Party platform, but how come she didn't really talk about it? What what was going on behind the scenes? What was that decision about? <laughs> well, no, she did talk about it, and the, unfortunately, there's such a long list of issues to talk about. This is true. There's such a long list, and some are just barreling down on us. You know, climate change is in our faces. We see it in so much, in, uh, you know, weather circumstances. Um, the, the poverty reality is barreling down on tens of millions of people every day, not sure if they're going to have money for food, which actually basically would solve that problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, you just, issue after issue uh, is so urgent. But basic income was part of her agenda, so I may not have gotten to highlight as much as you'd like. But she definitely supports a basic income. Yeah, I mean, the, the, well, obviously, like one of one of the main uh, points, pillars of the campaign was the ending student debt, and that's huge. I mean, and that's important to talk about because it really points out the hypocrisy yes. of the system. If we're going to bail out Wall Street, but yeah. not the victims of you know Wall Street's uh, criminal yeah. activity, uh, yeah. fraud. But um, it, again, a basic income that affects everybody. That would help. Everybody, I just, I'm just, I'm just saying this now. I'm just venting now, renting out, you know, <laughs> renting now. So hopefully, hey, maybe you know, in these next campaigns, uh, I, I really hope the Green Party or any party well, really uh, realizes that this should be the a, a pillar, the main pillar, because it brings everybody into the movement, not just, <laughs> not just people with debt, although that's a lot of people. You know, I think, I think basic income is one of those issues I'd like to see emphasized more, too. The other one that relates to basic income that we need to start to talk about is money. Why did we give away the power Ooh, yeah. that's given to us in the Constitution, given to the government in the Constitution, to create money? Why do we have to borrow money from Wall Street banks and go into debt when we can create money without debt? Yeah. This is one of the, this is one of the most absurd decisions ever, you know, because a lot of the pushback on basic income and on free college and, and infrastructure and all all the things we need to spend money on is where's the money come from? Well, yeah. guess what? We can create the money, and we all you have to do uh, to balance that is to be very closely monitoring any kind of indications of uh, inflation getting out of control. Uh, but right now we're in more of a deflation, and we have been for most of the Obama's uh, uh, term in office, more of a deflationary period with very low interest rates. Um, you know, so it really wasn't a threat now. We could have spent a lot more money and got a lot more done uh, during the Obama term. But the reality is we should take back the power from the banks to create money. Uh, and I think if we do that, 
then a lot of things can be solved. I don't know why we don't even discuss, just like basic income. These are two topics that were not discussed uh, in the campaigns, and they both need to be, I think, near the top of the list because they're both massive transformational changes. If yeah. we can create money without debt, provide everyone a basic income, we have solved so many problems so quickly. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's uh, an issue that libertarians bring up. But That's hey, right. like like the the Green Party, they're they're kept out of the debates. It's amazing. Um, it is amazing. Oh, cause cause you know you got people like Rachel Maddow, who she she recently said, did did you see the clip where she blamed the Democrats' defeat this election, uh, on, in and she used Florida as an example, <laughs> blamed it on third parties. She said something to the effect. I think she she said, if. 100% of Jill Stein voters and 50% of Gary Johnson voters had voted for Clinton. She would have won. And so that, well, I, I, I know I find the Democrat. Well, she's a Democrat. Yes. Right. So let's, let's put her partisanship on the table. Mm -hmm. You know, she's a Democrat and she always talks for the Democrats. She gets a lot of her talking points from the Democratic Party. She always has Democrats on the air. That's what she emphasizes. And to me, Democrats are such a party of looking for scapegoats. You know, whenever they fail, they blame somebody else. They never look in the mirror and say, Hillary Clinton may have failed because she yeah. made all those speeches to Wall Street banks where she said she's two-faced. Uh, Hillary Clinton uh, failed, failed because she supported the bombing of Libya and the destruction of that common, uh, country and laughed about it when, they, when, 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 when the, their leader was killed. Hillary, Hillary Clinton failed uh, because she never, even though she knows single-payer health care is the right solution, that 80% of Democrats want it, she will never consider it. You know, so issue after issue after issue, the reason Hillary didn't get those votes, because she didn't earn those votes. Yeah. Jill Stein and Ajamu Baraka earned their votes. And they had, to, they had to earn their votes going over hurdles. They had to earn their votes by being excluded from the corporate media, which gave Trump and Hillary massive amounts of free publicity, and almost none to, to Jill Stein and John Baraka. They had to earn their votes going over the hurdles of ballot access laws that are designed to keep them off the ballot, uh, and that was a major hurdle they overcame. They had to overcome the hurdle of the phony uh, Commission on Presidential Debates, which is essentially a Democrat and Republican Party disguised as a commission, and they decide who gets to debate, and they always decide Democrats or Republicans get to debate, and nobody else. And when you can't get in those debates and reach 60 million people or more, some say there were 100 million people at the first debate watching, uh, and then you can't compete and you become irrelevant. And so the reality uh, Rachel needs to face up to is her party is in trouble because they are a party of the oligarchs. They need, they need to step back from their uh, – have the Democrats have a conflict. They get a lot of money from Wall Street and big business and other monopolies, telecoms, et cetera. But they also have voters who 80% support single-payer health care, you know, who want money out of politics, who have a whole different views than the oligarchs. It's a conflict. You can't represent both. And they try to represent both. And that's why Hillary has to be public and private in her various positions. Privately, she can tell the banks, don't worry, you're not going to be prosecuted. Don't worry, we're going we're gonna to repeal Dodd-Frank. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Health insurance, don't worry, we'll, we'll make, rather than single-payer, we'll create subsidies, we'll pay people to buy your lousy policies. Uh, don't worry. Uh, you know, but publicly, we're going to provide health care. Oh, we're going to uh, c control those banks. We're going to, you know, all that nonsense. And, but people are smarter than that now. Mm. People know they're being lied to by this oligarch party. And Rachel Maddow, unfortunately, has become part of that echo chamber of misleading people about the Democratic Party. So they're looking for a scapegoat. They did that in, 19, in 2000. When Gore lost to Bush, one of the worst Republican candidates ever in history, and Gore lost, why did Gore lose? Well, they like to blame Nader, but the reality is Nader got you know, 20,000 liberals voting for him, 30,000 uh, Democrats voting for him in Florida, at, and George Bush got 300,000 Democrats to vote for him in Florida. And they're going to blame Nader's 30,000 versus Bush getting 300,000 Democrats? 200,000 self-described liberals voted for George Bush rather than Al Gore. The real question the Democrats should have asked, rather than looking for a scapegoat, is why did Gore and Lieberman lose? And if they look at that, what we're going to see is Gore was one of the founders of the corporate Democrats, uh, and uh, the, he, he helped to create a, a caucus that focused on corporate de uh, Democrat policies. 
He supported every war since the Vietnam War. He picked Joe Lieberman, who's worse on both those issues. He may be the most corporate of all Democrats, most hawkish of all Democrats during that time period. He lost because he was a lousy candidate who ran a lousy campaign. Uh, and, and as a result, he, he, did, he lost votes to George W. Bush, a Republican who should not have ever won. But that was the Democrats' fault. And all these years of scapegoating Nader has prevented Democrats from looking in the mirror, and now they're trying to do it again with Hillary Clinton. Blame the FBI, blame the Russians, blame the Greens. Don't look in the mirror and, and realize, uh, we all saw your emails, folks. We all saw those DNC emails. We know what you're really thinking. We know you're saying to your, to your candidates, don't let too many Black Lives Matter activists in your office. Don't, don't agree to any of their agenda. That's what your emails are telling us. So why should African Americans vote for Democrats? If that's your attitude, we're going to ignore the black agenda. And you put it in writing. And now we get to see it. So Rachel, look in the mirror at your party. Stop looking for scapegoats. Yeah. yeah. Now I I uh I totally agree uh like Maddow's words that were ridiculous. I mean, to say if 100% of these voters voted for you know, Hillary, she yeah. would have won. I mean, that's like she. Yeah, if 100 percent of Trump voters voted for Hillary, she would have won too. <laughs> I mean, that's just an insane, insane thing to say. But I, I want to play devil's advocate though, and they and, and I knew you wanted. To I do know, that. you I know could, it. I could, I could feel that. Energy. Yeah, I set it up. <laughs> um, is obviously the spoiler effect is real. So yeah, what thank, do you? Thank have, goodness. So thank what do you? Goodness. Yeah, I mean, was that is that by design? I mean, they could change it though, but they're not, right? You want to? So what do you say to that? The, I mean, how do you defend? That oh, the spoiler effect is real. A number of things. Yeah. First of all, they could change it. If they want to put in place ranked choice voting, uh, our vote would never be a spoiler. We'd disappear if we didn't win. Uh, and, and that's one reason I have my doubts about ranked choice voting. Because throughout history, dealing with a two, part, two corporate parties, two big business parties, is not a new thing. We've always had this reality throughout U.S. history. And the way we've made progress uh, often has been because there were third parties who put out new ideas and ideas that the two parties would not discuss. And when we got enough votes and third parties got enough votes to affect the outcome of the election, that's another way of saying spoiling. I think it's a show of power, electoral power, when you affect the outcome of the election. Then the two parties have to listen to you. Mm. They have to either adopt your message mm. or become the Whigs. Who were the Whigs? The Whigs were a party that disappeared over slavery. That's one of the great examples of a successful third party effort was a series of, of uh, parties that ran against slavery in the 1840s and 1850s. They, they didn't win, they had some great candidates. They didn't win, but they gradually weakened the Democrats who were a slave plantation owners party and the Whigs who were Northern industrialists who profited from slavery. These two parties refused to discuss abolition. They kept it off the agenda in Congress. And so people finally started running candidates. And gradually the Democrats got weakened, the Whigs got weakened, and many Whigs and Democrats went to abolition parties. And then an abolition party developed called the Republicans, and their candidate, Abraham Lincoln, won a four-way four -way race with under 40% of the vote. Most successful third-party candidate in history, in fact, the only successful third-party presidential candidate. Uh, but you can look at that, that's so that you can become the Whigs and ignore the third parties. Uh, uh, spoiler power, or you can adopt our message. And throughout history, since the Whigs, they've learned to adopt messages of third party. That's how we got the right to form unions. That's how we got the eight-hour workday. That's how we got ending child child labor. That's how the big banks were were broken up. That's how big energy was broken up in the early 1900s. You know, that's how women got the right to vote. That's how the whole New Deal came out of the agenda of the socialist and progressive parties. So third parties have played a role because they have the power to spoil, because they can show their electoral power and impact the outcome of the election. That is the only power we have in a corrupt two-party system that represents business interests, an oligarch system of two parties. The only power we have electorally is, uh, is, is going into third-party politics, independent party politics. We have more power than politics, though. Uh, the biggest power in the electoral politics comes out of this the biggest power is building a mass movement that is strategic and consistent, uh, stands for issues that already a majority of people support, 
as we do in our political work today. We look at the where the public stands on issue after issue, and they're with us. They're not with the, the oligarchs. They're with us. And our job then is to show that, like this protest at the DNC. People know they were betrayed, a betrayal party. We showed it. We showed the rally. Uh, you know, and so uh, that is the job of a mass movement, is to represent the people's interests and push that agenda and big, get big enough and strong enough that we set the agenda. And that's where I think we are now, the fact that we could de defeat the transnational corporations with the TPP, we could defeat the, uh, the telecom industry with net neutrality. These are, there's many other examples of successes, you know, stopping the KXL, there's so many, so many other examples of the movements that have won. We have power. We should not be afraid of that power. We should embrace that power, put forward what's needed for the country. If you look at our, our people's agenda, everything on that list has two-thirds support in the American public. Uh, so we have the people on our side. We just need to mobilize them. And it doesn't take many to mobilize them. There's a, a research that shows over the last 100 years of uh, resistance efforts that if 3.5% of the public gets mobilized, the public always wins, whether it's a dictatorship or a democracy. 3.5%. We had probably 0.01% in the Occupy movement. And look how that shook the, the foundation of the elites. They were scared from 0.01%, you know, a few hundred thousand people. If we get into the, and we're getting into the millions now, people who are mobilized, if we get into the multi-millions of people being mobilized and taking action, the people will have power, the people will set the agenda, and the people will make their agenda a reality. That's what's going to happen if people mobilize. And I suspect the Trump presidency is going to be a presidency of protest where you see some mass mobilizations that will have a greater impact than Trump will in the long run. Nice. We, uh, I, we planned to only do 20 minutes. We're going on for a while. I have a couple more questions, if, that, if that's cool. If, no, it's, it's cool uh, to me. I just, okay. I just hope, I hope, hope your listeners aren't getting bored. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the magic of YouTube is they, you know, they can, they can, come, they can come turn back. it off. Yeah, they can turn it off, come <laughs> back whenever. Yeah. Um, so uh, when Jill Stein was, was running, she, she often like referred to um, the superdelegates – the Democrat super delegates and Super Tuesdays as a as a kill switch, uh, used by the Democratic Party to you know prevent a uh, real people's candidate from winning. Um, right. And um, so was that the actual intention of uh, Super Tuesdays and Super Delegates? Can you give us a short history lesson on yeah, that? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Um, I do think it was intentional. Uh, you know, the the the, the, we, the Democrats represent their moneyed interests. That's what makes their camp their campaigns go, and they feel like they can't win without that. You know, and so they set up a system that made sure that if you didn't have money, you couldn't win. Uh, and a lot of that involved um, uh, creating a, a series, a, a schedule uh, for uh, the primaries that required you to have lots of money, uh, like in, you know, one month you have to be in 30 states. You know, or Super Tuesday had to be in a half dozen or more states. You know, when George McGovern won, he had been on uh, the commission that developed the primary system for the year he ran. He was a co-chair co of that commissioner, that commission. And he set up a system, uh, the system they set up was much more open to people's influence. They had a, only a handful of, of primaries in each month. So it allowed for candidates to really focus on those states campaign in those states, for the voters to get to know what they stand for, to hear in-depth discussion and debate on the issues they stood for, and the people decided. You know, there was like three to three to four states per month uh, in that system. There were no superdelegates. Uh, and so the new system, which developed after the Carter-Kennedy run, um, where Carter survived uh, a challenge from Kennedy, uh, this, the creation of superdelegates was developed after that. And that allowed for the party insiders, every elected official and others who the party deemed were uh, appropriate for superdelegates, uh, had, the, had a major power uh, in that they could, you know, vote what the party wanted. And that, that became a bulwark. And it doesn't only affect at the end of the election. It affects at the beginning. Because if you, start, if, like Clinton, started out with, you know, 400 superdelegates. So already 
Sanders was a, a deep hole. And so whenever you put the scorecard up of where people, you know, where the two candidates were in the in the horse race, Clinton was ahead because she had hundreds of superdelegates. And so that, that kind of makes it harder for Sanders or any other challenger to develop the momentum. So, yes, this is these are the United States uh, is a country that has in place the strongest two party system in the world. And they, the, the party system stays strong because we live in uh, elections that are really a mirage. They're really managed elections, closely managed by both parties. This year was an unusual year in lots of ways. And I think it, 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 in the future is going to be can continue these trends. First off, you had under 30 percent of voters in the United States saying they were registered with either Democrats or Republicans. 29% Democrats, 21% Republicans at the beginning of the nominating process. 50, 46 to 50%, for the first time ever, a plurality and maybe even majority, were registered, saw themselves as independents. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Major change. And so then you saw two populist campaigns in both parties. You know, Bernie Sanders ran a populist campaign against Hillary Clinton. And he struck on issues that people agreed with, the same issues that we have in our uh, po agenda, you know, people's agenda. Uh, and uh, Donald Trump also ran a right-wing populist campaign. Uh, unfortunately, he, he had this bigotry part of it, which I think is kind of a dog whistle to get some of that base going. But then he also had a very strong economic side of it, which challenged the trade agreements, with which talked about bringing jobs home, which recognize the problems in the Rust Belt and recognize the insecurity most Americans feel about their economic situation. And so both candidates played this populist thing. So both campaign, both primary campaigns uh, for, the, for the nomination had this elites versus people, elites versus people on both sides. And when it got to the final general election, elites versus people, Trump was on the people's side, Hillary's on the elite side. This was not an elite year. Uh, and so I'm, I'm yeah. sure many many Sanders voters probably voted for Trump or stayed home. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. I wish they had the courage to vote for the third parties. And that's, I think that's one of the, that's one of the big weaknesses of the of the U.S. system and U.S. voters hmm. is they are manipulated into out of fear to vote for one of the two parties. People want to be with one of the winners, uh, and they, they they don't realize that what we're doing with the independent parties is we're building a long term electoral effort. It took 20 years of abolition losses for us to end slavery with a, a, a new party. Uh, and it may take 20, we're not now in this situation of ending corporatism, and it's going to take years of losses before we have a party strong enough to challenge corporatism. Um, and so, but that's the battle. Both parties, you know, keep off the agenda, getting money out of politics and, uh, you know, uh, ending crony capitalism, not these trade agreements for corporations, all this corporate crap that we get from both parties uh, is the reality of Washington, D.C., and we'll get it from Donald Trump, too. Um, and people will see that and be disappointed and face that reality. But we need to start to start vote for what we want, not vote boast on fear, but vote for what we want. If you looked at Jill Stein's agenda, it was the people's agenda. If you look at what people's views were in polls, it was Jill Stein's agenda. So if they had voted for what they actually believed in, we would have a very different uh, uh, government. And if the young people, the, the millennials, had voted uh, with a candidate who was actually talking about ending student debt, which would be a massive, massive improvement in people's lives, Jill Stein would be president. And so it's a real shame that people are manipulated into voting for lesser evils with lies like the 2000 election and fear-based voting, all the ways they trick us yeah. as, we pro as we protested at the DNC. Yeah, a lot of people don't vote third party out of fear, but I think a whole lot also don't vote third party because they don't even know about them. They don't even exactly. know they're an option. That's right. One of the big problems we have is the mass media, the corporate media. Uh, you know, that's one we just Johnson did better than, than, than Stein did for a while was because as far as corporations go, Johnson, the libertarian view, was very friendly. Less regulation, no corporate taxes. You know, uh, all, all the, the agenda was basically a Republican agenda that's big on pro-business. He favored the T. He was the only candidate that favored the TPP, and so his agenda was a corporate agenda. So the mass media would cover him because he supported the yeah. agenda of their board members. Jill Stein did not support the agenda of the board members of of, of MSNBC. Yeah. You know, Gen General Electric would not be happy with Jill Stein. You know. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a clip of you know obviously with with Gary Johnson they made this whole 
that whole thing up about Aleppo, you know, that's like all they played. But th- there was a he also messed up on the TPP. He didn't he, he didn't even know he said he supported the TPP and he didn't even like he, he didn't even know what it stood for. <laughs> He didn't exactly. even know what the acronym stood for. That got, I mean, I just stumbled upon that. And I was like, oh, my God, why is this not, why are they not talking about this? Well, because it's the corporate media. They, they're, and, 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 and the TPP not only didn't know what it stood for, Trans-Pacific Partnership, but also he didn't know it was actually More crony, than trade cap- deal. Yeah. crony, crony <laughs> capitalist uh, uh, trade, not free trade. This yeah. was written, literally written by big business interests. Yeah. Both those hundreds of advisors who... Uh, uh, worked with Michael Froman, the U.S. Trade Representative, uh, in secret, helping to write the document. But Michael Froman himself was a Citigroup executive, uh, and many of the people he brought in to U.S. Trade Rep were former lobbyists, lawyers, and executives uh, of, of various big business interests. So they wrote the law. They wrote the treaty. This was a of, by, and for big business treaty. It was not free trade, as, as Johnson, in his libertarian uh, non-thinking way. Oh, they call it free trade. It must be good. No, it's yeah. free trade is a propaganda term. This is crony capitalist trade. This is rigged for the big business interests, and it should be something that the libertarians all opposed because it's the opposite of free trade. Not that I'm a fan of free trade. I think we should be designing trade to serve our purposes. That means the Paris Agreement, you know, on climate change. We could design trade to help meet the goals. Of, of, of protecting the planet from from climate change, uh, there are there's international laws on uh, labor rights. Trade should represent that as well. There's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which lays out a whole series of issues: so healthcare, housing, right to a job. All these issues that uh, we should make reality. We could use trade to make that a reality. So I favor trade for people and planet. In fact, we're changing the name, flush the TPP to trade for people and planet, because we see this as a long-term effort as part of our shifting the political dialogue to the people's agenda, trade is gonna be shifted to the people's agenda as well, which is what I just described. And so it's trade for people and planet, not trade for big business interests. So, uh, well, we covered a lot of stuff. There's so much more to cover still, but uh, why don't you uh, tell us what popular resistance is all about and what uh, you know your organization and what you're what you think you the you know we should be working on um, now and what you're sure. working on with popular sure. resistance sure sure well thank you for that opportunity uh, i've talked about some of it already you know, the people's agenda and, and pulling the political discussion in our direction but popular resistance uh, came out of the occupy movement we organized with a bunch of other people an occupation on Freedom Plaza called Occupy Washington, D.C. We initially called it Stop the Machine, Create a New World, because that's our strategy. Stop the bad and create the good. We see a two-pronged strategy. Stop the machine, create a new world. And that still is our over- overarching approach. But popular resistance came out of uh, Occupy after Occupy finished, after that phase of the movement. People like to say Occupy failed. That, to me, is like an idiotic concept, because it, the uh, goals of Occupy continue. We just aren't sitting out in the streets and, and, and you know with tents. We're now working for these changes, and we've had some very successful campaigns. But basically, the the site is a movement site. If you want to know what's going on in the movement, you go to Popular Resistance. Look at the front page; it covers all aspects of the movement, uh, and not just uh, locally and nationally, but often internationally as globally as well. Because we do see a lot of this to be a globally connected movement. Uh, so if you want to know what's going on in the movement, popularresistance.org, sign up for our daily digest. Great way to start the morning. Much better than reading the New York Times or the Washington Post, you know, the corporate media. Read the people's media. What are people doing to challenge the system? Daily digest is great. We also do a weekly newsletter, which looks at the last week and analyzes where the movement is and where it should be going and what lessons we learned from the last week. But then we run campaigns, and uh, we ran a campaign, uh, a number of campaigns. We uh, we're involved very heavily on uh, climate issues. Uh, we work with a great coalition called Beyond Extreme Energy that's trying to stop uh, the climate, uh, you know, by climate uh, tipping point by stopping putting in place more carbon infrastructure. 
and more carbon development, kind of the opposite of the Trump agenda. <laughs> so that'll be escalating uh, under the Trump Trump agenda. Uh, and we also, you know, ran a, worked on a very successful net neutrality campaign with a great coalition of groups. Um, you know, we were kind of the radical fringe of the group, uh, which I think was critical to success. That's the role we often play in coalitions, is we are the, the radicals who don't compromise and who fight uh, in, a, in a non-traditional ways to get what we want. And the net neutrality campaign, for example, Market Flowers and I started to occupy the FCC, something never done before. And by the end of the week, we had uh, one side of the building covered with 20 tents, and we had all the commissioners, three, three out of five of the commissioners, including the chairman, coming out to talk to the occupiers of the FCC. We had the uh, commissioner holding a session in the FCC to lift the morale of the workers because they, they were on our side, not on the side of the commissioners who were pushing for this cable TV-like tiered internet where you pay for what you get. The TPP campaign, uh, the, the fight for stopping the, um, the, the export terminal at Cove Point, Maryland, which would be the largest uh, export terminal on the East Coast. It's right in the middle of a residential area, which is the first time in anywhere on the planet where they put an export terminal in a neighborhood uh, where a blast could cover miles kill thousands of people. Uh, and the pollution that comes out of daily will shorten the lives of probably tens of thousands of people. And so we're fighting to stop that uh, terminal from being built and, and be, becoming operated. So we cover a lot of different campaigns, where, and, and you can see more of it on popularresistance.org. I really want to urge people to get involved. Uh, this is a time when we're going into this Trump years with the Congress controlled by Republicans that we really need to step up our game. And I'm not talking just about popular resistance, but all of us as a movement. We see this all connected. It's a movement for economic, racial, and environmental justice, as well as for peace. And those are all connected issues. Uh, and these single-issue campaigns of the past uh, have been proven ineffective. And I think we need to focus as a group and support each other. So come to popularresistance.org, sign up for our daily and weekly uh, news uh, letters. And if you can support us financially, it's urgently needed. We want to have a broad base of financial support. Five, fifteen, fifty dollar contributions are all welcome. Uh, we're in a, a end of the year fundraising goal right now, trying to raise forty thousand dollars by the end of the year. Uh, I think we raised six thousand so far, and so please come in and support popularresistance.org and get involved because we really have an agenda. We've mobilized with that agenda successfully in the past, and we're going to be increasing our mobilizations in the Trump era so that we the people have even more power. And it will surprise, I think, a lot of the elites that we have not backed down. We've stepped up. And so please get involved. Join popularresistance.org and uh, help, 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 help our, help our, our, our uh, uh, campaigns uh, move forward. Thanks, Kevin. Do you have a radio show, too? Or no, oh, we do, we do. No, we do have a radio show. We're, I think, in our fifth year. It's called Clearing the Fog Radio. It's uh, an AM station called We Act Radio in Washington, D.C., but it's also web-based. You can get podcasts. If you go to clearingthefogradio.org or just go to Popular Resistance, uh, you'll see it listed on the right-hand side with all of our other campaigns. And the radio show basically tries to cover the news from a movement perspective. We try to have on guests who are active in the movement or who are writers in the, about the movement uh, to give a different angle on the news than you hear from the Washington Post or the New York Times or MSNBC. Uh, we, we like to pers analyze things from the perspective of what people can do uh, to put in place the policies we need. Yeah, I heard a good interview with uh, Jamu Baraka you know, a few months ago. Couldn't really find an interview with uh, him anywhere else. Um, Ajamu, Ajamu is a really good guy, and uh, he has a long history of doing excellent work. And I'm really pleased that uh, Jill Stein picked him for the vice presidency. And, uh, and I think he ha brings a human rights analysis uh, two issues that no one else, obviously running for president or vice president, did. Uh, he also brings an international perspective because he's very been involved around the world, uh, and he also brings a black uh, radical perspective because he's always taken that. Not going to get that so, from Mike Pence. <laughs> not going to get that from Mike Pence. Or Tim Kaine. <laughs> or Tim. <laughs> yeah. Or, what, what, or the or the libertarian, what, what, who, 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 yeah, um, well, the one who ended up, yeah, I know, I, I knew his name, I was just joking. Yeah. Uh, the one who ended up supporting Hillary Clinton, rather than Gary Johnson. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so uh, th thanks, uh, Kevin. These oh, 
You're going to have me on that radio show. So I'm Noah Jamu Baraka, but hey, I love talking about this stuff. We, um, we, would like, we would like that. We should do a media show and have some independent media folks on. That's a great idea. We, we should do that sometime. I'd be totally game. All right, Kevin Zeese, thanks again for joining me and all the work you do at popularresistance.org. People check it out. Donate if you can. Talk Thank to you, you some other time. All right. Peace.